and welcome to yet another ACCE Learning Network Hangout for 2015. It's a place we can connect with our PLN to network, share our teaching and learning adventures. Hi Amanda. Hi Roland, and as usual, if you're watching us live, you can post a question to our panel tonight, or to us, we're on the panel, that was weird, um, by using the Q&A feature in this broadcast. And I'm Roland Gesthausen, high school teacher, e-learning leader in Victoria, Australia. I'm a member of the DLTV, and I'm weaving my way between the uh, various things our family has constructed. Um, this is a tissue box, and Victoria is filled with cold and snow at the moment, so it's wonderful. I think there's something retro about pulling tissues out of the pharaoh's nose. Um, did you do that? Or oh, that was the, the brain. No, it's been a really busy... I mean, we had the gang show, and we were recovering from that. It took us um, a whole week to recover. Um, I've got a, a gang show bear here. Um, that's a scout. It was a little wobble and gang show badge. and um, Awesome fun for the family. So I love scouting, and it's been awesome fun for my kids. So that's been my last couple of weeks. Amanda. <laughs> I'm Amanda Ravlin. I'm an e-learning coordinator in Brisbane and QSite member and I love to uh, tinker and make things and in the last two weeks during school holidays I decided to have a relaxing time moving house um, but this means after we've unpacked a few more boxes we can move on to the next phase which is build a cardboard city with make do. Yay! Yay. And just for fun also a giant ice cream because it was there and I was like oh my god giant ice cream uh, anyway show and tell phase one this is a hat my daughter made she's free so that's pretty cool it's not oh, really my size cool. also um, is a castle for her toys anyway enough about me <laughs> let's get to know our lovely panel tonight because they like totally grok <laughs> Ah, oh, that was so punny this evening. <laughs> so oh, we get started with Bruce, who's just snuck in at the very last moment um, as we started our broadcast. Bruce, do you want to introduce yourself and also test your mic and stuff? Okay, well, hopefully you can hear me all right. You can hear me up. All good. Excellent. Yeah, Bruce, I'm uh, down in Canberra. President of Information Educators ACT, and I teach computer science at school. And these guys all know me very, very well. This is what I spent my holidays making. I have the first stages of my 3D printed TARDIS. The next bit is sticking it on a base that will spin and flicker and do all those kinds of cool things. So that's my project Sound for this term. As, uh, <laughs> absolutely. And I'll spin and everything. So. I tell you what, that's it. We're, doing, we're going to do a Doctor Who episode and uh, celebrate this sci-fi culture and look back over time. That is just totally retro and awesome. I have to find my scarf. No, lock, yeah. it, lock it in, definitely. <laughs> so cool. yeah, I'm just jumping in to join us tonight. Excellent, lovely to have you with us as always. Uh, Katie, do you want to introduce yourself? So hi, I am Katie. I'm a software engineer at Grok Learning. I haven't had holidays recently, so I haven't built anything cool to share with you. <laughs> but have you built software? Um, I have been building software. Okay. So okay. at Grok Learning, uh, it just finished uh, at the end of last week. Uh, we've been running a web comp uh, where the students have been learning HTML and CSS for five weeks. Um, and culminating in the last week being a design competition where we gave them an HTML page and each of the students designed their own version of the page only by changing the CSS. Um, and they turned out really well. It's been really great looking at all of the, uh, uh, the entries into the competition over the last uh, two weeks. Yeah. Well, that's fun too. It's not quite the same as holidays, but it's still pretty fun. And we look forward to a bit of show and tell around that later, I hope. Yay. Of course. And the lovely Nikki, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, hello. I'm Nikki Ringland. I'm uh, one of the founders of Grok Learning, um, and I'm also uh, pretty active in the National Computer Science School, um, in the Girls Programming Network in Sydney, and a bunch of other teacher outreach uh, activities that the University of Sydney runs. Um, in a few weeks, well, a few weeks or a few months, I will be handing in my thesis. I, um, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. No, no way. <laughs> Um, long-awaited thesis, yeah. Yes, yes, long-awaited. Uh, and 
I have been building connections over my holidays. Oh yeah, um, it's it's a little uh, yeah. So we were at ISTE, and I have uh, I I do have a prop, a, a great stack of um, business cards of really exciting, awesome people um, that I want to spend more time talking about computer science outreach with. Yay, that's really exciting. Cool. That's really good, and I. I think that, um, Amanda, we're talking tonight about the uh, the Grok Learning Competition, and it's about more than just coding um, with uh, Python. It really seemed to broaden, so I hope you do tell us a bit some of the tricks it is. Absolutely, and some of that exciting show and tell. So um, there's, there's a few different things that the Grok team have been working on recently. Should we get started by maybe um, exploring what the web comp was all about? And seeing some examples. Katie, do you want to walk us? Do you want to walk us through the web comp, and I'll get some examples up for screen sharing. Perhaps? Okay. Yep. So if you um, start the screen sharing, then um, mm -hmm. I can give a little bit of background. Um, so the goal of the web comp uh, is to teach kids HTML and CSS. Um, we find that a lot of the time. Uh, kids, as they're learning to to build websites, they use some kind of uh, user interface system, like a, a graphical tool where you sort of drag and drop and you write things, but this always ends up uh, becoming more difficult over time because HTML does not work particularly well that way. It was never designed to do that. So our goal was to teach kids to build their own websites uh, with HTML, with CSS, um, and uh, to, have them, to have them actually look good, to have them uh, build uh, site after site that looks good, that looks professional, that looks like something that you would see on the internet. Um, so that they really get an understanding of how how these websites on the internet are made. So, so Katie, you, I mean, all you need for teaching kids HTML is just Notepad. Um, I'm just wondering what makes um, something like um, a tool for teaching kids HTML really useful in the classroom. Well, part of the problem with uh, just experimenting on HTML uh, with with Notepad, uh, there's a couple of problems with this. One is if you do something wrong in the HTML um, or in the CSS, it's often very, very unclear why that is the case. Or your website looks wrong and you just don't know how to make it look the way you want it to look. Um, so if we go through in the Grok Learning System with a series of stages where you build up those skills and you understand as you go through what each of the different HTML elements is for and what each of the different uh, CSS properties is for, uh, then you get to really uh, go through those stages um, much more uh, fine-grained than just my site doesn't look right, I don't know why. Um, the other thing is often you don't know as a student uh, what the full range of things that are available to you uh, in HTML and CSS. Uh, there is a lot of CSS properties that you might never have heard of before, uh, so if we can go through them one by one and explain exactly how they work, um, then we can build some cool sites with that. One of the things, in, yep. some yeah. things in particular, sorry, just one more thing. Um, some of the CSS properties are really not obvious how they work uh, until you actually go through um, how, they, uh, how they're supposed to be used and how they function. Uh, so for example, the vertical align property in CSS you would think would make it easy to align things to the top of the page or the bottom of the page or the middle, but it doesn't actually work anything like the way you would expect it. Uh, okay. So um, by using a tool like what you built here, um, you've got the pedagogical scaffolding for tinkering with the code, seeing the results straight away, and um, doing it more than just experimenting as some of us do might with a WYSIWYG um, browser editor. So I think the other thing that I was I was demoing as well was that we still have that same auto marking, so that the students get that immediate feedback, not just on um, whether they've understood sort of enough of the content to make something that looks almost valid, but whether they've really understood the meat of of, of the concepts that we're trying to get across. And if not, then exactly what they've done incorrect, so they can go back and, and have another read of it. Cool. If you kind of just experiment and build a site, you might end up only building the site that you 
uh, know how to build rather than being challenged and pushed to build a specific site um, using things that you don't necessarily know before. So this is the interface that you've developed, and it's, it, it mm -hmm. looks very similar to the one that I've seen from the, uh, the Python programming challenge. Could you explain a bit about um, how a teacher who might not be familiar with it um, would orientate themselves? Sure. By jumping in and getting, <laughs> getting going and then asking us lots of questions because we like questions. Okay. Um, so but as a simple well, rundown, there's, uh, on the left panel you've got there uh, a series of notes that explain each concept. Um, so each dot is one of the pages of notes and each uh, sort of diamond shape in that little row of dots at the top there is one of the challenge problems. Uh, so if we look through, this one is uh, talking about uh, HTML5 document structure. So in a, this is another thing where you wouldn't necessarily learn it from uh, just playing around or uh, building a site. Um, the, the good structure of an HTML document and how it makes it much simpler for you to uh, see from the document and understand what each part does using sort of good HTML5 semantic and uh, or semantic HTML. How it's important for other accessibility issues like screen readers and things like that, which is not something necessarily that uh, uh, students consider uh, unless it's important to them, but it's important to a lot of people, so it's good, good practice. Yeah. Um, so going through here, if you we're looking at one of the problems. Uh, so this is. Uh, you can see here on the left it has a description of what we want the students to build for this particular challenge. Um, in this case they're building a site uh, for an aquarium and it gives them some of the HTML and some of the CSS to start off with. In this case we're looking at headers so you only have to build the header. Um, but Nikki if you edit some of that HTML there, um, maybe change the, uh, the title. Yep, so it says, I don't know if it, the text is big enough to read for everyone, but it says Argleton Aquarium. Um, and if you change that, yep. Ah, okay. We now have our own aquarium in our live demo. Yep. I don't know oh, why okay. you have a brick pattern at the back there. Oh, that was, I was mucking Rusty. around with... Um, okay, um, can you zoom out on the uh, preview? That's kind of handy, I can see now. Um, um, and you're actually working with the native closing. Yep. Looks like one of He's the He's been too busy thesising to uh, have much. Yeah. So that doesn't quite look how it's uh, supposed to look there, Nikki. Yeah. Can no. you switch over to the uh, CSS file and uh, change some things around? OK. OK. Uh, scroll up a bit. Yeah, so this is a CSS. Um, so you can see how along the top bar um, at this, of the screen there, there are different files. Mm -hmm. um, so this mirrors exactly what you would look have on a, on a local file system on your computer when you're building a website. Um, you have your HTML file, a CSS file, and some images that you're including. Uh, so Nikki's going to edit the, the uh, file here. Um, so we've given the students, in this case, the, all the files that they need. If you click on the Aquarium Hero at the top there, uh, we can see the picture that we're using. It's a bit big. It doesn't quite fit on the screen. Yep. Um, so that's the file that we're using that we've got in our little file system here. Um, and Nikki's put that into the CSS as a background image, and so now we can see in the live preview as it updates um, that it looks to me like it matches the uh, what the question is asking for there. That looks pretty good to me. Shall I mark it? Yep. Ah, oh, that's this is different. So I come to the front, and I've got 26 kids, and I'm racing around the room checking out the code. Oh dear! Since you changed the header, it doesn't I quite have the right. Changed the header. Hang on. Yep. yep. Sorry. Sorry. Go. Go ahead there. <laughs> Yeah, see, at this point, I'm running around the classroom with 26 kids. Sir, could you check this bit of code? Or, oh, sir, this doesn't quite look right. And I'm scratching my head thinking I've maybe got better things to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm so in, as always, yeah. the tests are designed to, to point out to you uh, where the problem is, not just tell you that your, your code is wrong somehow. Mm. And, yeah. and in quite a lot of detail as well. So I can actually see uh, the header H1 heading should contain this text, but actually contains that text. So ah, um, it's very easy. It's exceptionally easy, the feedback we've received, for, for teachers to uh, identify what the issue is, uh, though sometimes the students still need a reminder that they should uh, read the particular test case that, that it's failed on. I so rather like your scenario, Python yeah. uh, challenge, <laughs> this is actually allowing teachers to do what teachers are good at doing by asking very questions, quickly, challenging students, yes. yep. and instead of getting bogged down with the mechanics of uh, building this. So I'm impressed. I, I, this looks very familiar to one of the um, uh, websites that uh, one of my students actually made for their uh, VCE outcome in Victoria, senior students, and he cut it with a notepad. But 
um, he'd been lovingly learning how to craft it over the last three years um, using a, um, another website tool that I can't mention. But I'm impressed. And so a student who's doing this would be able to um, take the ideas away and apply them to um, more complicated problems and ah. uh, larger sites. Well, funny well, you should mention that. So this, the questions in this actually do get quite complicated. Um, okay. We, uh, we probably pitched it actually a little bit too difficult. We uh, aimed to write a beginner course, but there were so many exciting uh, bits of CSS that we were, uh, wanted to throw in. We put a little bit too much into it. Um, oh, you guys are so cute. <laughs> so uh, next time, uh, we'll, we're hoping that this will be uh, roughly the level that we're expecting from the intermediate competition. Uh, and we'll add a beginner stream as well that takes things at a little bit of an easier pace. So just for context, this is the uh, the final question. Um, the students had to make this, uh, do, do all of the CSS for styling this. Yeah. Wow. So the students actually, they start off with uh, only the, the HTML that looks nothing. It's just text and links. Um, and they go through all of the steps to make it, uh, to make it look amazing. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just loading the wrong question. But what I actually want to show you um, is that the the design tournament. Um, mm. So as a final bonus week, uh, the students were encouraged to submit their own um, uh, CSS stylings of, of a, a site that uh, we came up with which is very similar to, but legally distinct from Rotten Tomatoes. We've got sprouted potatoes. Um, and it's a competing brunch. Yeah, yes. Um, the, why don't I jump over to... Tournament. Tournament. Yep. Here we go. So these are some of the designs that the students came up with. Wow. Um, from so essentially... They started with pure the HTML. HTML. And nothing, and no styling whatsoever. And so everything that they've done here to sort of split it into two columns, to choose the fonts and the colors, everything has been uh, purely creativity from the students. Wow, that's impressive. Now, some teachers might be a little bit daunted by this and thinking that uh, um, this is just too much to aspire to. Um, how difficult do you reckon it would be to take students from you know, a basic understanding of typing um, Hello World on a web page to uh, this stage? Hmm. I mean, it depends a lot on the students. Uh, if you look down uh, this uh, list, though, you'll notice that there are some grade uh, six. So I think there was a grade this, four. This student is in grade six, the student who, who uh, um, put this design together. Wow. Now that's, that'll be inspiration yeah. for those other students that are thinking about uh, joining in. You don't have to necessarily be a senior student uh, programming. No, absolutely not. We, we uh, as, as Katie mentioned, we also had some excellent designs coming in from students uh, in grade four. Wonderful. And I'm impressed by some of the institutions there on your leaderboard. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. We've got a, a healthy mix of um, uh, students from all across Australia and, and New Zealand and beyond even. So that's been uh, very promising. Ah, here we go. Here's, here's a, <laughs> uh, this is a design yep. by a student in year four. Yeah, we were particularly impressed with the little cartoon sprouted potato at the top there. Oh, that that's so nice. cute. <laughs> it looks a little bit evil. <laughs> just really like their movies. They just really like their movies. So, so no, I don't think that there's anything um, particularly uh, conceptually challenging that students would um, struggle on, even if they were coming at this from a from a completely blank slate, having never done any HTML. Or CSS before. Um, Essentially, yeah, the, the ideas behind HTML and CSS where you have a document and you're adding extra information to it um, is a little bit tricky at first, but once students get over that, it's mostly a matter of just learning a whole bunch of different ways of styling things about what are the mm -hmm. possibilities that the technology has. Some of the CSS properties get very tricky though. Yes, yes. Um, Nikki or Katie, I mean, what would you suggest to a student who's um, thrown themselves into the challenge and they're having a bit of fun and then they get stuck and then the teacher doesn't seem to know the answer either. Is that a bad thing? I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, teachers to demonstrate that actually it, adults don't know everything and it's okay to still learn. In fact, learning is something that we'll be doing our entire lives. Um, 
uh, it's a, a great opportunity for teachers to actually sit down with students and learn together and work through a problem together. Um, and the students tend to, to really enjoy that sort of uh, honest environment um, and, and, and have a lot of fun with it too. It's, it's really nice as a student to be able to both do something that's that's perhaps academically challenging, but also uh, useful and and useful in your in your class setting. Um, that isn't to say that they're on their own then if their their teacher can't necessarily help them with a particular issue. Um, but we have during our competitions we have a, a forum where they can ask uh, other students for help, which is obviously great for them to to uh, help one another, uh, but also our tutors for help as well. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was uh, on the forums during the web comp uh, for the, the five weeks uh, and it was really fun to see, like you would get uh, students that were stuck on a particular uh, problem and sometimes I could help them but sometimes they would uh, solve the problem themselves before I uh, could even get in there. <laughs> I have images of great mountains of pizza, or actually maybe great mountains of Sydney University students volunteering to answer questions, standing behind keyboards, lined up next to great quantities of food. They're at the ready. They certainly will Google, be doing the um, challenge. Now, Bruce, that's quite daunting, um, that change of role where teachers become more facilitators and uh, no longer the, the sole stage who knows all the answers. Um, how do you find uh, teachers in ACT being able to cope with that cultural shift? That's an interesting question. Um, I have to admit I've never really found myself in a situation like that at the moment. Um, but I'm working with a couple of colleagues right now who are in an environment where because students are working on a myriad of units at all times, they're often in a situation where students are working on problems in subjects that they know very little about. So one of the things that we that I put together for some students this semester was an advanced web unit and it involved writing or basically building a website from a server all the way up and the other teachers had never seen this stuff before ever. So students would get problems and they'd have to sit down with them, go through the APIs, that's something that they did know about and take them through the process of how you actually read formal documentation, how do you decipher it, how do you use that and examples that are out there on the um, in on the internet through you know sites that usually come up when you do technical searches like Stack Overflow and talk about why those solutions work and I think that's the difference when you've got a teacher sitting down with the student and you're identifying a solution you're then able to explain the solution to the student and it doesn't become the student grabbing it chucking it in and then it working and then not really understanding why, it's really, really important that they just sit down and explain it. And I guess if you look at HTML and just basic stuff as an example, it can be really difficult for students initially to understand how to position elements on a page relative to one another. The block model in HTML is relatively simple, but it can be confusing given the nature of different types of elements. Um, the way you deal with a heading is different to the way you deal with, say, um, a couple of emphasis tags. So once students understand those differences and they have a bit more of an appreciation of the terminology and the way that the different tags apply in different circumstances, it becomes a lot, a lot more easy for them when they come across other tags down the track to be able to work out what type of tag it is and therefore what kind of rules would apply. Amanda. <clears throat> so Katie, there's a lot of different uh, standards in terms of web design and HTML and um, I just want to kind of get a feel for what, what are some of the standards and common things that the students are guided through through your um, the sequence of learning. Right. So this is one of the things that I, I think made um, this a good time uh, to run the the web course um, because we are 
slowly getting to the point where there are actually standards that, that different browsers are following. There's still definitely differences between the browsers, but there's certainly a lot more communication and a lot more agreement on what those standards should be. Um, we decided in the web course to teach uh, HTML5 and CSS3, which are uh, the latest uh, industry standards that are, have been adopted across uh, all of the major browsers. Um, so this includes things like in HTML5, there are several new uh, elements which have more uh, semantic value than the uh, sort of earlier uh, very basic uh, HTML elements. So you can actually say this part of the document is a header. This is sections and articles and how the document is divided up. So we were careful to teach that uh, in our HTML course. Um, so that uh, students would understand, wouldn't end up building websites that were divs all the way down, um, and they would build proper semantic uh, websites. Uh, in I the can same see you way laughing we... there, um, Nikki. What's wrong with this divs all the way down? I've seen that before. Um, yeah, no, di divs are great, and, and table table web design is excellent, and, and frames. <laughs> Why can't we go back to frames? So, so the, the great thing about web development and web design is that it's constantly innovating and improving. Um, the, the downside of that is the, the stuff that we perhaps learnt uh, a decade or so ago um, may not be entirely uh, recommended uh, for, for general consumption at the moment. Um, so there are lots of different benefits of, of designing web with semantic web. Uh, we men I mentioned um, accessibility and screen readers. Uh, it turns out uh, fr frames or, or divs uh, make that very, very difficult. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we, I, I, I have, my heart has a, a soft spot for the blink tag, um, but it turns out that most of the things that, um, that that uh, the blink tags, we, we can do it all in CSS, essentially, is, is what I, I want to go to. If you, really, if you really desperately want to be able to have that GeoCities feel, you can make it happen again. Oh, wow, I just can't <laughs> wait for random bits of blinking tags and popping codes and sliding layers. <laughs> we had a lovely Oh, we had a lovely talk in Victoria with Mark and a few of the guys about um, some of the horrid things that can be done with uh, HTML. Hey, you guys must have had a bit of fun, because you would have had to not only think about all the things that can go right. You've got to actually think of all the things that could possibly go wrong, because you've got to sandbox this in a web browser. It's not like I can reach out, leap out, and uh, drag this thing into the world where it's not meant to belong. Well, to a certain extent, like from a technical perspective, that was easier for HTML than it was for Python. Um, when we're running arbitrary students' Python code, uh, that is a very scary thing. Uh, as a, uh, someone running a server that you're just letting people write Python code and run it on your server. Uh, a web browsers uh, on their own are designed to be very secure because you're ex essentially running uh, someone else's code in your website. And so if we, so we actually run um, a version of WebKit uh, on our server. And so that's already in its own reasonably secure box. Uh, we run it in another sandbox, which is the same one that we use for Python. Um, so the the security questions were a bit easier this time than they were for Python. I think that it'd be good to talk a little bit about some of the uh, Python stuff, because um, the Grok Learning Challenge is going to make a kickstart, and that's been your flagship uh, product. So. Um, Nikki, would you like to give us a bit of a show and tell on that for the people who haven't seen it before? Sure. So the, um, the NCSS challenge, the National Computer Science School challenge, mm -hmm. um, has been going on for about eight or nine years now. Um, I'll just pull up my screen sharing again. Um, so it's five weeks of, or perhaps, Katie, do you want to screen share this time? So I can multi, um, oh no, I can do it. Um, oh, you're doing a good job, Nikki. Okay, uh, I've got to talk at the same time with this one though, it's, it's harder. Um, so it's five weeks of interactive um, Python uh, courses. So, so, so we have notes and questions similar to the web competition that, that, the, uh, that we looked at before. Um, and we, t we teach Python, um, it's a uh, general purpose programming language used widely in industry, and it's a great language to learn. Um, so we have interactive notes, just the same as with um, with the web stuff. You're right. Uh, it actually isn't as hard to learn. I mean, I must admit, I was raised on 
Cobol and uh, Pascal, mm. and I'd always had a soft spot for that kind of uh, line programming. Um, I'm currently teaching using um, a blocky type interface, so using um, Scratch, and then I evolved the students into uh, the uh, the grappling and challenge with writing code in Python. Um, that's always a bit of a dilemma, isn't it, Bruce? Being able to move between this block model of learning and uh, the um, approach where you've got the inline. Oh, Was sorry that about that, Roland. <laughs> If you're um, moving from, uh, say, a block learning approach with um, a program like uh, Scratch to an inline program where you're um, typing chunks of code and then running to see how that executes. Funny uh, you should mention that. <laughs> uh, I was hoping that might be your cue. Go on. You could mention that, Nikki. Then we'll explain. I'll, I'll let Bruce think about his answer. Um, so we, we agree that this is actually a, a, a very difficult concept for some students. Um, and, and it, it is quite quite challenging. But what we've done in our Blockly course, so it's a visual programming environment, uh, but as the students are pulling these blocks together, we're also generating the Python code um, below in, in this box here. I, I, hopefully you can see it. Um, so that the students are getting a, a bit of an idea about how you, um, how you make that transition between a visual programming language and, and what the underlying code is that they're actually making. Um, one of the great f points that I, I find with this is when I've been running this in a classroom setting um, with our girls programming networks and with other students, um, unfortunately I find that, that um, some of the, the less confident students uh, tend to say, oh, I'm, I'm not really coding, I'm not really doing um, programming, I'm just sort of playing with these blocks. Uh, it's like a jigsaw, but having the code there um, is great in saying, m making them not uh, disallowing them from from selling themselves short. Saying, no, actually, this is the code that you're generating. You're, you're dealing with some quite complex concepts here. Um, good on you. That's impressive. I've just noticed you've got strings, substrings, numbers, output. There's just a bit all you need to do. Um, the linking between um, a block environment to an inline program. So, so the, the code that we're, we were generating there is is, um, is actually a Python code. It, it, that, that link is essentially almost already done for the students. Yes. Mm. Yeah. We find that um, once they've been using blocks for a while, um, they start to do bigger, com bigger programs, more complicated programs, and the blocks get very frustrating uh, just because you have a series of blocks, you want to make some change, and you have to move a, se move a lot of blocks around in order to make it happen. Um, having the Python code right there, the students can see it, the colors even match up between the Python and the blocks, um, and they want to learn the Python. It, it, even, it looks even a little bit easier. In fact, it, it's one of my favorite responses when the students start complaining about the blocks being frustrating. <laughs> You're ready yeah. to step up. Yeah. Bruce, what do you think about the um, the pedagogy of um, teaching students to code um, using the strategy? Look, one of the difficulties is always learning a syntax. And if you have a look at some of the other languages that people tend to teach with, things like Java and C++, the syntax can be very, very daunting. Even something like JavaScript, because it has a lot of punctuation, uh, semicolons, brackets, braces. Um, it really is enough to, to scare less confident students away. So the blocks give you a really nice way of introducing a concept without worrying about the syntax. And then you can teach them how that particular block maps to a specific syntax. And I think that's where what the Grok platform does with the block and the Python code underneath is really, really powerful. Um, in the past, we've done that with putting up a, um, a block, asking students what it does, explaining that in pseudocode, converting that to code in the language of choice. Uh, but this sort of eliminates a lot of those steps, at least in terms of the, the mechanics of going through it. You still need to do the same explanation. But uh, as, as Nikki and Katie have both mentioned, as students become more confident with the syntax, it becomes a natural progression from the blocks to, to, the, to the code based uh, input. And it really makes no sense. Uh, 
to stick with blocks once you're doing complicated things because it does, it becomes extremely frustrating. Um, and that's something that a lot of the block-based languages are, are working on, but they'll never get to the point where they're as convenient as using text and students pick that up pretty quickly. I think if it is uh, trying to write essays using crayons, there's a, there's a point when you have to switch to coloured pencils. So I think one of the other things uh, that's worth mentioning about um, blocks, the, the, the visual programming that we're doing, is more and more we're seeing, well, I, I've, when I've been speaking to primary school teachers, they're getting their kids engaging with computing in, in Scratch or Alice or some other visual programming environment that's really good at getting kids in there, having fun, moving a dog around on a screen or making a, a ballerina turn around. Um, but this is the, the what's next. How do we get students from manipulating and exploring um, cool things with a computer to actually solving problems with a computer. How do you see um, students who want to um, extend their knowledge? They've had some fun, they've done the competition, and they want to take it that step further. Um, maybe explore the idea of having a career or um, continuing to work on some of the exercises or activities. So one of the great things about uh, the challenge which is coming up is that for the last two weeks of the competition we actually get a whole bunch of industry mentors to jump on the forums and answer the students questions about what it's like to work in industry, what do you actually do every day, do I need to know maths to be a good computer scientist, to be a good programmer. Um, and the kids have this great dialogue with, with, uh, with current engineers um, so they can ask all these questions freely. Uh, as for how to get there, I mean, the, the mentors have some great advice on that, but um, we've got a lot of resources to get students uh, who, right from, from Blockly, from that never having programmed before, up until a uh, university level, our, our advanced, the advanced streams of our competitions are, is, they're very hard. Delightfully so, I would say. <laughs> You're torturing yeah. us. Yes. I can't even read the questions sometimes. They're murder. <laughs> And then come and chat to us on the forums. We'll be happy to uh, walk you through it to a certain extent. I need to bring a big box of pizza in my tissue box <laughs> <laughs> for a good cry. Um, but that's actually really important, Nikki, because um, I mean, if I'd be a great programmer, I'd be programming. But um, I find that the team are really approachable. And for me, um, what's been really good is that, that gender leveling because I have a lot of really talented girls in the classroom who are studying IT, who are choosing to make it a career. And I don't think they're as um, frightened or daunted by um, the kind of environment that uh, has been set up here with the uh, the challenge and how to program. I know you've also made um, your team available for being able to um, encourage kids to take up programming, and that's been really greatly appreciated by you've made the odd 15-minute um, uh, introduction. I don't know really enjoyed the hangouts with your students, so I'm, yeah. I'm glad they're, uh, they, they enjoyed it. And the students enjoy the forums. It's quite a slap in the face. But these are real people, and they're mature programming students um, who um, talk in a really positive way about life after school, and that's a big fear with some kids that often wonder where this will take me. Um, and it's also a great uh, opportunity for students who perhaps are the only kid or feel like they're the only kid that's interested in computing at their school, from their, from whether they're from a re regional school or they, they just don't see other students as interested as they are, to suddenly be in an environment where there are, there's 9,000 other students on this forum who are all learning the same thing and who are all really excited about this. That's a, a wonderfully positive experience for them. So. I'm just conscious of the time, but I, I thought what would be really good to do was to think about the um, classroom environment and some of the ways that um, teachers can do this in a way to drive real change, to gain an interest in computing, and also perhaps, uh, I don't want you to give away your roadmap, but um, just some ideas about uh, where teachers can uh, take this in the classroom, um, perhaps where they don't have a, um, uh, an IT subject at a senior level or um, an IT class. So one of the things that we've uh, been seeing in a lot of schools uh, over the past few years is um, uh, certain teachers are getting entire year groups who, who aren't doing, um, who haven't chosen computing as an elective, but uh, all of year seven or all of year eight to participate in the challenge so that they then have that experience with what programming can be and how much fun it can be 
um, and can make those decisions later on about choosing the computing elective. Um, and that's been really positive. Uh, so a lot of the time it's the computing teacher who's orchestrated this with the school and then the school would, would uh, do it as part of a, a special subject. Um, in other cases, it's the, the maths teachers who have actually said this is relevant to the maths curriculum um, and we'll have all of year seven or all of year eight um, do this competition. So actually one of the things that we haven't talked on yet that we perhaps can get back to is uh, logo and Python turtle. <laughs> Um, but but yeah, so so that's uh, that's some of the ways. Maybe um, Bruce can talk a little bit more about a teacher's perspective on that, though. I have. I just we did it one show. Um, found one of the original turtles, the Tasman turtles that were programmed um, and built in uh, Tasmania, and they used Logo, and they were one of the first interactive devices I think you could use in a school system here for programming and driving around. And um, I think it was used as a hook with uh, Seymour Papert and. Uh, Gary Sager, sort of two brilliant educators who were uh, in Melbourne maybe two decades ago. Amanda. So I thought um, it could be an opportunity before we get on the logo kind of track, which we almost had a segue there, um, just to throw to Bruce to talk a little bit about um, mentioning how this fits with the Australian curriculum. I think one of the um, real challenges for a lot of teachers is, is being confident with the material that's in the digital technologies curriculum. And the great thing about something like the Grok Learning Platform is that it provides the content uh, and the scaffolding that you need to be able to walk people through it. Uh, you don't need to necessarily be a computer scientist to be able to put this together and you don't need to have a whole lot of programming knowledge either. And in fact, there's nothing that's preventing you from saying to your students, hey, you know what, let's, let's walk through the beginner's uh, course as a group and that'll give you the opportunity to sort of take the weaker or the newer students through it. And then turning around to the others and saying, hey, if uh, you want more, you've got the intermediate stream, you've got the advanced stream, give it a go. And, um, you know, you can then use those students and their experience in later projects to help the others out when you're taking it all out of the platform to, to build up a project or something that you might want to do for an assignment work. So um, if you're not sure where to start, it's things like this over some of the other freer options that are out there um, that are a lot less guided and scaffolded that, uh, that really do benefit. So um, actually you, you touched on uh, walking through as a group. So uh, one of the things that we are very happy for is for students to, to work together in solving these questions. So a lot of the um, a, a lot of the, the teachers that I've spoken to will introduce a concept, let's say, uh, the beginner's week two uh, includes if statements. So they might um, have a discussion about what, what, how can we get computers to make decisions and then perhaps split the students up into smaller groups and they can work through some of the questions together, uh, perhaps solving them together completely or coming up with a, a flowchart sort of scaffolding of how to solve the actual problem um, and then working independently. But, but we, it's all about collaborative learning and, and formative assessment and we want the kids to have a great time, however that uh, may be. And I mean, it's really a competition in name only, isn't it? I mean, there's yes. nothing preventing students from <laughs> that, actually working together. I'm sorry, you, you don't win a car. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you win imaginary internet points and a highly respected place on the leaderboard um, and badges and achievements. Uh, but no, there's, we, we definitely strongly encourage students to work together, especially in the, the uh, beginners and intermediate streams. You can really bring out the, the best in the programmers. I was stunned to see my colleague uh, Catherine, who is on the other campus, and she's a top-notch programmer. Um, and teachers don't often get to see um, how each other working in the classroom. Um, She's got a wonderful eye for detail and being able to edge students through. And we've done video link-ups, as you probably gathered, with the Grok team, but also with um, other schools. You're almost edging into artificial intelligence there. Is that what we'll be building next, perhaps, um, in 10 years' time with the Grok team? Um, well, uh, I don't want to talk about the fact that my oh, uh, thesis right is in machine learning. Um, <laughs> I'll have you back to talk a bit about she your uh, PhD remember. thesis. You can give us a reading. <laughs> 
Nikki's sort of waxing lyrically thinking about this uh, PhD thesis that uh, she has uh, pinned up on the wall there. Um, Katie, uh, while Nikki's just restoring connection, um, do you think that um, that's where we're kind of edging, that kids are now actually really seeing what computers are good at doing and being able to build on that? So they're not necessarily programmers, but um, they've got a much better native understanding about what makes them tick and how to leverage the best out of them. Well, I find that kids uh, these days tend to have a really good understanding of how to use technology um, and how to how technology impacts their day-to-day -day life. They're using it to chat with each other. They're communicating. They're finding information on the internet. Um, but most kids really don't have an understanding of how any of these pieces are built. Of how it's it's like you're you're sort of eating your food, but you don't know where it comes from. Like you don't know that your meat comes from a cow. Like the the kids these days sort of don't actually understand that each one of these things was built by people and one of the beautiful things about software is that anyone with a computer can then go and build these things too. Uh, so I don't know if we're really going to be teaching the kids uh, full AI and have uh, um, sort of um, uh, suddenly little uh, robots uh, taking over the world from the students but um, they are definitely, uh, the idea is to get them to see uh, what the potential the technology has, what the, how they can uh, express uh, problem solving in, uh, in coding uh, and such, write a program that then solves every problem rather than uh, a human doing it over and over again. And I think that's, that's a really important point, actually, um, Katie. A lot of people have been critical of the digital technologies curriculum on the basis that not every kid is going to be a programmer. Um, I, you could apply that same argument to the maths curriculum, to science, mm. to history, to anyone else really. But um, I think what the digital technologies curriculum does is it teaches students another way of thinking, another way of approaching problems, a way of uh, decomposing a problem into smaller parts and actually thinking about how to make something very, very complex, very, very simple. Uh, and that's something that you don't necessarily see in other curriculum areas. So that's the value in the curriculum area. And I think coding is just a really, really good um, tool that we can use to give students that experience. Yeah, I would agree. There's, there's something um, very valuable about the process that you have to go through when programming of I am thinking through, I have this problem that I need to solve and you have to really break it down into a series of steps and essentially write the instructions in a way that is completely unambiguous such that, that the computer can then solve that problem uh, every time without, without help. You really, um, these kind of problem solving skills can then be applied to anything. Absolutely. So, talking to about applying problem solving skills to anything, do you want to talk about um, the the logo aspect that we kind of touched on before? <laughs> yeah. So I'm really excited about this. Um, this is coming up in the next uh, NCSS challenge. Uh, what we're looking at doing um, is, as part of the challenge, as the students are learning Python, uh, they'll be using the logo Python API uh, to construct shapes to draw pictures um, and to to have these little uh, programs. So if anyone's not familiar with Logo, um, it's a programming language on its own that is uh, conceptually very simple. You have this little uh, arrow on the screen which is your turtle um, and you can say go forward, turn right 90 degrees, go forward um, and you can say put the pen down and it will draw lines on the screen so you can say go forward, turn 90 degrees, go forward, turn 90 degrees, go forward, turn 90 degrees and it will draw a square. Um, oh, see that's what I do with my kids. Where are my shoes? And I say go forward, turn 90 degrees, take two steps, look <laughs> down, under the couch. Ah. Um, exactly, but this turns out to be a really good way <laughs> to teach programming concepts so you could say um, write uh, some a little bit of code to draw a square and then you can put it in a loop and you can draw a hundred squares. Um, it really very clearly demonstrates how uh, using the constructs of loops and ifs you can then construct programs that can do uh, more, than, more than you could if you were just sitting there typing go forward, go right, go forward, go right. Yeah. Um, so 
we're uh, building this in uh, throughout the challenge, so there'll be a couple of logo questions every week during the challenge, um, and there will be uh, both using uh, the the logo concept to teach the programming concepts like uh, dealing with numbers or if statements and loops. Uh, so you'll be learning that and write, writing little interactive logo programs uh, so that you can, uh, it'll ask a question, you type in the answer, and then it will draw different shapes depending on what the, the user in, inputted, that kind of thing. Now, I'm going to ask up this completely at left field, and I throw this as a challenge to my students. Um, I like them to sort of gain a sense of spiritual attachment to this programming code. And I ask them, what is your favorite Python command? And why? You mean one of the built-in commands? <laughs> yeah, well, whichever one. Are you a bit of a, a loopy person? Uh, are you a variable person? Uh, you um, run until? The guys picked uh, random in my class. I just thought that was totally awesome, and we didn't do enough of that. Random is pretty cool. Um, I would say I really love Python dictionaries in general. Um, we unfortunately don't get up to dictionaries in the beginner course because they're sort of a little bit of an extra mental leap. But this idea that you have a big um, lookup table um, where you can very quickly, instead of, if you have a whole list of things, if you want to find something in the middle, you have to go through every single one step by step. Um, but with a dictionary, uh, you can sort of look things up very quickly uh, anywhere in the dictionary. Um, and this is amazingly useful for a whole range of different problems. So I would say Python dictionaries are my favorite. It's not a specific command, but I hope that counts. Bruce. I oh, love dictionaries are cool. It's hard to beat it. But the other thing that I really like is the list comprehension, a nice shorthand <laughs> way of taking data that would be a list and filtering it out for exactly what you want. I think it's um, a really nice shorthand. And it actually reads pretty nice in Python as well. Um, you know, it, it makes sense. Bruce, you stole mine. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I very much, I, I like the neatness of list comprehensions, but I, I guess then I'll have to, to choose another and say, actually, if statements. I, I really like, um, I really like that I can sit down with a student and get them to build a simple program that makes a decision and that they can understand absolutely every single word and every single character in every word um, that they've used. That there's no magic, there's no boilerplate, there's no template, there's no don't worry about this, you'll understand it later. Um, they really feel like they, they've they made this program because they understand everything in this program. So for, for that, the simplicity of an, a Python if statement uh, cannot be surpassed. Nice. Amanda, you want to have a stab? She's thinking here. Uh, see, one can never go past random when they are a random or a series of loopy variables anyway. So, you know, random. What about you? I notice you're making a lot of puns in our group chat. Do you want to share some I am. My favourite thing actually. Yeah, my my favourite is the REM statement. Um, I remember watching some programmers at my uh, uni course, and the actual commentary was actually about two to three times bigger than the actual program. In fact, you had to actually hunt the source code in between all the comments. But that was before Tran. I don't know if you guys remember, but remember you had all the stars, and you had to put like your comments in boxes, and um, people kind of enjoyed that. They were just leaning on the star key. It was just, it was a fun feral time of um, when only 64k was you needed to run a computer program on a PDP 11. Oh, that was my age. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a wonderful hangout tonight. I've really enjoyed it. And you guys have been totally awesome. And I think that uh, it's been really good to um, hear some of the different ways that uh, you're leveraging uh, some changes in the classroom. And it really is happening. Um, I've been totally re-engaged with uh, programming with my kids. And um, one of the biggest pleasures um, Nikki and uh, Katie is um, having the students stand up at a school assembly and receive a certificate for programming just like the mass challenge and just like the sports kids. Um, they kicked a goal and boy were they proud and you helped make that possible. Thank you. A pleasure, an absolute pleasure.
And what would we be as um, hosts of with the Grok team if we didn't give them the opportunity to give us a list of their links and key dates so that we can sign up and any other special extras? So, so the, the NCSS challenge this year starts on August 3rd, which is coming up very soon. Um, we'd love to get uh, more than 10,000 Australians participating and a bunch of internationals as well, so we'd really like to see you. Um, uh, particularly of particular interest, we are very happy to sign up any teachers for free um, to access to all of our courses and competitions, the web stuff, the Python stuff, the logo stuff, um, and some exciting things that uh, you may have talked about or maybe not that we've got um, while I was gone. We've got exciting things in the pipeline. Um, so if you want to come and come along and check it out, uh, send us an email to info at groklearning um, and we can uh, put that link up, um, or you can uh, harass me personally. I'm the only Nikki Ringland to my knowledge. Um, so that's the challenge. The summer school yep. is... Can I talk about summer school? Yes. Yep. So the summer school uh, is run by Sydney University, and it's hosted uh, at Sydney University. Everyone stays uh, in accommodation near the university for, for uh, 10 days. And it's coming up uh, in January. I believe it's January the 3rd, uh, early next year. Um, and this is primarily, uh, like, firstly, we get about 100 uh, high school students. So if you have students going into years 10 and 12, um, then that would be uh, the ideal uh, set of students to apply. Uh, so apply now. Um, uh, and but it is also open for teachers to come as well. So the teachers that come, so uh, we've had Bruce come in the past. Uh, they learn alongside the students, uh, and there's two different streams. There's one in Python where we teach Python for a few days, um, as well as HTML and CSS, and as groups with the students build complete social networking sites. Uh, and this is a, a huge exercise in group. Uh, project management, um, but as teachers, you would be learning the entire uh, course with the students and participating in building social networking sites, uh, which from what we hear from most of the teachers that come, they're uh, excited to be one of the learners in the class rather than having to be the teacher all the time, um, but also just seeing the way that we go through uh, in a very, very condensed period of time in 10 days, a lot of material uh, with these students, which is probably not possible in a classroom. Uh, context at that speed. There is also uh, an embedded programming stream uh, with uh, Arduino robots uh, and coding in C as well. So if you're more interested in that, that is also an option. And Bruce can give you a, an unbiased opinion um, of both of those, but uh, considering that he's come along numerous times now, uh, are we going on four this year, Bruce? There's more than five. that. Five. Five. I think this would be year number five. This will be year number six. Six this year. So yeah. So um, perhaps not that unbiased. Uh, so w one other thing I mentioned um, uh, that teachers can sign up and participate in, in the the challenge and our other activities. But um, if you're a student and you're watching this podcast and saying this sounds great, but I can't uh, participate because my teacher doesn't know about it. One, tell your teacher. Two. Even if your teacher doesn't know, or, or perhaps you can't tell them because you're on summer holidays in the Northern Hemisphere, um, you can participate by yourself by signing up and uh, jumping in and learning alongside. You don't need teacher support uh, if it's not there because we've got a whole army of tutors who will be sitting on the forums waiting to answer your questions. That's totally awesome. <laughs> Amanda. Um, okay, so should we do a final wrap-up, or was the what's your favourite Python the wrap-up tonight? No, uh, that was just a throwaway line. I use it oh, just, Okay, cool. All right. So what we might do is get everyone just to do a, a quick kind of reflection, and then Roland and I will do one, and then we'll head towards our close for this evening. So, Bruce, do you have any key reflections from this evening's Hangout that you'd like to just summarise and share? Only just, there was uh, one more little trick in Python that I think is really cool that I didn't mention, and that's um, using the double colon minus one in a uh, <laughs> list index to reverse it. Something that really does kids' head in when you show them the first time, um, but yeah, it's cool. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. 
the plane. Get my head in. Try it. <laughs> um, Katie. Um, I haven't been to this hangar before, so I don't know what the little reflections are supposed to be. Um, uh, but just you know, grand statements that have grand statements about the universe. The world, you know, um, yes. Yes. I'm really excited about this uh, upcoming NCSS challenge. Um, there's a, uh, I'm going to be visiting, uh, I care a lot about in particular getting uh, girls in girls schools excited about uh, programming and I, ca I went to an all girls school and I'm going to be going back to my old school uh, to join in a couple of classes uh, while they're doing the NCSS challenge in the classroom so I'm really looking forward to that. That's fantastic and it's so great to have you join us this evening. It's been really good. Thanks. And Nikki, words so, of wisdom. Uh, words of wisdom. Um, I really hope that uh, some of our passion about computer science education uh, came through tonight. Um, we, Katie and I and the whole team are ridiculously excited about the challenge and about WebConf and about Python logo and about all of the things that we do. Um, it really is what what keeps us going and it's great to have such an awesome team and it's great to have so, so many awesome students who participate in the competitions but it's also wonderful to have so many teachers who are willing to give up their Monday nights uh, to come and talk about uh, Python and web and HTML um, and I think that's a, a wonderful reflection on just how much fun it is. So I guess the last thing I have to do is spruik a few of the question concepts to uh, really get you interested. So this year, uh, mm -hmm. we will be learning what many wonderful things, like how far ASIMO can run, um, what exactly a pangram is, um, mm -hmm. and uh, how many coffee beans it takes to keep the Grok team fueled. Ooh. Wouldn't just the joy of computer science keep you going? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but um, we, we have our uh, little help helpers. Yes. Little helpers. Yes. OK. That sounds cool. Well, Grok team, I want you to go forth. Bring peace and international understanding. Build equality and to infinity and beyond <laughs> double colon minus one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Amanda. Uh, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us, us this evening. I think one of the things that always stands out to me when we have you guys on board is, is actually just your passion, enthusiasm, and real, true love for computer science and just sharing that. And it's been really interesting to watch the, the types of things that you've been working on evolve over time. And it's not just a here's a site where you go learn how to code. You've actually got so many support structures built in and a lot of that is to do with the community. And I think what's really cool as a teacher is it's not just about you as an individual supporting your students and there's all of the right kind of ingredients to when a student is struggling with a problem, they can get through that and get to the next step and build on their enthusiasm and excitement. It's not a, oh, I couldn't solve this, so I'll stop now. That element of challenge just keeps going. And it's so amazing the breadth of ages that you've got involved there as well. And like I say, every time I've got to get more into this for my own learning as well and start inverting lists or whatever it was that Bruce was just talking about that sounded really cool. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're still working on the details of our final show. We may have something pretty exciting from the DLTV conference to mm. share with you. Roland and I need to work together on the magic to that make that happen. But um, check out our ACCELN Wikispaces page or even better, join our ACCE Learning Network community on Google+. And if you're part of that group, we actually send all of our invites to events there as well. Um, and if you'd like to join our panel or have suggestions for future shows, please let us know. And we also have a range of exciting playlists linked to from our ACCELN uh, YouTube channel. I may have said too many C's. Oh, uh, yes. There. You may have picked up the acronym by now. Yes. <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thanks for having Good us. Night. Bye.